Welcome to the Luke Messia Show. Christmas is just around the corner. We are in the last week of Advent, and several very desperate Republicans forgot one simple truth. Watch this clip, and then let's get to the show. The Bush era in Texas ends today. Tony Busby was a gift to Texas during the Ken Paxton impeachment trial. And in his closing, he reminded everyone of one simple truth. The Bush dynasty ended. It ended during the Paxton impeachment trial. It ended when George P. Bush lost his Republican primary. It ended when the Bush family tried to get Dan Branch elected to the attorney general's position. It has ended time and time again. One of their nephews ran for Congress in Fort Bend County. He lost. The Bush dynasty is no longer a dynasty in Texas politics, and this is a very good thing. When I speak to Republican clubs and conservative groups across the state, and I bring up George Bush, you get almost unified disdain. Not just conservative or Tea Party activist groups, I'm talking normal Republican women's clubs. And that reality showed forth when George P. Bush made it into the runoff and had a a glass ceiling of sorts. And that glass ceiling was basically the Texas Republican primary voters saying the Bush dynasty is over. Well, that message did not get to J.C. Jutton, who is, as a Republican, one of the most pro-trans Republicans in the Texas House is what I call J.C. Jaton because he is. He actually got up and gave a speech last session saying he wanted to make sure that taxpayer dollars went to mental health care facilities that are socially transitioning children with radical transgender ideas. Okay, Tony Tinderholt stood up and said, hey, there's this grant program. It's going to give money to build out these mental health care facilities. I just don't want the money to go to any facility that is also socially transitioning these kids with transgender ideology. And J.C. Jatan got up and said, absolutely not. We need that. Those facilities need that money. This program won't exist if we stop giving it to these facilities that are transgendering all the kids. And he convinced 10 of his fellow Republicans to vote with him. Well, he decided to do a puff piece in the Houston Chronicle. Now, why J.C. Jatan decided that one of the best things for him to do right now while he's in a contentious primary is to have the Houston Chronicle write him a puff piece, I will not know, but I'm not J.C. Jatan. I also don't support transgendering of kids. So, like, I'm just, I'm not familiar with how he sees the world and the decisions he decides to make. But I can tell you that in the course of his interview, he literally said, here's what's funny. The reporter, before I get there, the reporter says that right before saying this, he paused like he wasn't sure if he should really out himself. So he's interviewing with this reporter. This is according to the reporter. It's in the story. You can go read it. It says he pauses and then he says, I've always been a fan of the Bushes. Now, he also said, I don't want Donald Trump to be our standard bearer. He doesn't want Ron DeSantis to be our standard bearer. Vivek Ramaswamy. I mean, those three people have basically like the 70%, 75% of conservative vote locked up. He actually said, I'm a fan of Nikki Haley. Like the worst, which, by the way, makes sense. And she also came out and she's not she's like not completely against all the transgender stuff on kids. So it kind of overlaps with JC's pretty radical views on this whole thing. It's really funny. JC wrote this long explanation. uh, And I already talked about this, I don't know, three or four months ago, where his his response to you supported giving money to all these mental health care facilities that are socially transitioning kids is. That's a lie. I voted to ban sex change surgeries. Well, of course you did. If you didn't do that, you'd be thrown out of your district. And you didn't do anything to help it. It died in the committee last time. 
Texas House leadership killed it two years ago. You said nothing. This time around, you voted for it when it came to the floor. He actually lied about what that bill did to help the mental health care facilities. He said, this is going to be dealt with in the other bill, which it wasn't. But he comes out in the Houston Chronicle and he says, I've always been a fan of the Bushes. And I'm, I like Nikki Haley. She seems like a potential future of the Republican Party. The Houston Chronicle says that he is a model for what the GOP wants. You want to know why? They actually call him a father of color in their article. That was disturbing. I'm like, what? what? They're like, did you know this guy isn't a white man? That seems like he should be the future of the GOP. This is the Houston Chronicle. This is what they say in their article. They're basically like, you should vote for this guy because he's not white. This guy's the future of the GOP because he's not white. That's strange. So it's this like walking diversity push. He's a liberal Republican. The Houston Chronicle repeatedly calls him a conservative Republican, conservative Republican, conservative Republican. They fail to mention the fact that he's one of the 15 Republicans that vote to Democrats more than any other Republican of 83. If you get 83 Republicans in the room and you say these 15 vote with Democrats more than everybody else, you'd say, those are probably less conservative Republicans. You might even call them liberal Republicans, not according to the Houston Chronicle. So J.C. Jutan goes and he does this big puff piece. He wants to make sure that everyone knows that he's a fan of the Bushes. He likes Nikki Haley. He didn't vote for Donald Trump for president. And he's this really conservative guy that doesn't understand why People are coming against him in his primary. Troy Nels has come out and endorsed against him. Troy Nels is probably one of the most popular congressmen when it comes to like congressional representatives in their district. He's basically a living legend in Fort Bend County. Troy Nels came out and endorsed Matt Morgan. So has Ken Paxton. All of this momentum is building up and J.C. Jatan goes, you know what I need to do to save myself? Go do a puff piece with the Houston Chronicle. And tell them I'm a fan of the Bush family. That's fine. Like I said, I'm not, I don't support the mental, social, psychological transitioning of kids. So I get that JC and I see the world differently. Um, but that one was a little surprising to see him actually go on the record, say he was a fan of the Bushes. Guys, we had new polling that came out this week from the Texas Politics Project. And um, it showed that Dade Phelan is underwater nine points in his favorables statewide uh, when it comes to voters. 22% of voters view him favorably and 31% of voters view him unfavorably. And just to give you perspective on this, I mean, this is worse than Joe Strauss ever had it, okay? I have said this repeatedly, but Dade Phelan is really on an island right now. He truly is. Um, we see that from an inside or kind of political perspective and then from an outside political perspective. So inside the chamber, he's just very isolated from the rest of the Texas House of Representatives. There is no central loyalty right now. Everybody's kind of on their own. And then outside you have Dan Patrick came out this week and literally talked about the fact that Dade Phelan dragging his feet on just telling us how much was spent on the impeachment trial is potentially a crime. By the way, some of the information that we do have already says the trial cost the Texas House of Representatives more than the impeachment, uh, more than the whistleblower settlement. So if y'all watched any of those clips I, I sent out during the impeachment trial and then during the actual impeachment in the House, Andrew Murr and Jeff Leach and all these guys just kept saying, Hey, you don't realize this guy wants us to pay $3.3 million. Now, they were gaslighting the Texas public at this point because of a couple things. First of all, they knew that the reason the settlement was a good idea is because if you take this case to some Travis County jury who are a bunch of Marxists, they're going to award tens of millions of dollars to anybody who wants to sue a Republican official. And then also they say, well, we got to save the money. Let's impeach the attorney general. 
You go, how much is it going to cost you to impeach the attorney general? And really the question is, how much is it going to cost you to try and fail to impeach the attorney general? And the answer is definitely more than four million, maybe more than five million for all we know. So they weren't trying to be stewards of taxpayer money. They weren't trying to watch after the pocketbook. They weren't trying to maximize property tax relief. They were trying to take out a political enemy. Dade Phelan is the least popular House speaker in modern history. I just, if you go into Republican districts, there aren't even a bunch of Republican districts who are hosting Dade Phelan to come to their district. Tom Craddock, Joe Strauss, these guys would travel the state for every Republican incumbent. Dade Phelan, he's going to one or two events. For the most part, he's staying home because he's in trouble and running his own campaign. Texas Politics Project polling came out. Matt Rinaldi even noted that literally he's less popular than Strauss ever was. If you go to Texas Scorecard, you can read the piece. More bad polling emerges for Texas House Speaker Dade Phelan. And there is a piece on J.C. Jaton if you want to read further about more of the stuff that J.C. did and said during that time. What have you been told all your life that if somebody's a minority in the United States of America, they're a left-wing nutcase. Uh, CNN, MSNBS, they've all invested millions of dollars and tons of hours to convince you that if you're a minority in this country, you have to be a Democrat, you have to be a socialist, you have to be a communist. Well, the Salcedo Storm podcast destroys that narrative. There are a lot of folks out there who are quote unquote people of color who just look at themselves as Americans who want to preserve this last best hope of mankind on the planet, which is the United States of America and loves our constitution, loves the rule of law because we know and understand what it means. So when you tune into the Salcedo Storm podcast, that's what you're getting. Every single podcast, one way or another, we're, we are dedicated to saving the United States of America as founded in the United States Constitution and destroying this narrative that, well, we Latinos are just all a bunch of left-wing nutcases. Now I wanna to go to a clip of Representative Briscoe Kane. And Briscoe Kane is somebody, many of y'all know this, but um, I actually helped recruit and run Briscoe Kane's first race to the, or not first race, but his first successful campaign to the Texas House of Representatives. He had run for state representative um, in an open seat that is now held by Dennis Paul. And Dennis Paul uh, won that seat. And, but then Briscoe moved and was in Wayne Smith's district, who was a Strauss chairman. And so I was actually talking to conservatives in Houston, trying to recruit people in 2016 and saw Wayne Smith as a vulnerable house uh, you know, kind of Strauss lieutenant, and he was a chairman. And so reached out to Briscoe and talked to him about running. Um, before I kind of go into this, you should know, like, I don't, I don't think I have a horrible relationship with Briscoe today. I don't, you know, I don't expect him to consider me some really close friend um, because, you know, he has fought against a lot of conservative things and he has aligned himself very closely with Dade Phelan. He fought to protect Dennis Bonin during the Bonin corruption scandal that led to Bonin's ultimate uh, decision to just step down and not seek re-election. But realize, like, even in that momentum, Briscoe was fighting every day to try to keep this deceptive, corrupt speaker in power and then fought to keep that same kind of corrupt, deceptive regime of Dustin Burroughs and Greg Bonin and Dave Phelan in power. So he and I just don't align in some ways. Now, on individual issues, we often agree. Briscoe votes conservatively most of the time. But I asked Briscoe to think about running, and he said, I don't know if there's any support in the Harris County area. So we started making phone calls and kind of getting a coalition built. Ultimately, he did decide to step in, spent less than $100,000 against Wayne Smith, who spent like, I don't know, half a million more, and won in a runoff election. And Briscoe was a hard conservative fighter for a couple sessions. And then under the Dennis Bond and speakership is really when he started kind of playing the game more. But a lot of it was behind the scenes at that point. And I, I was reminded of this by somebody. I went back and, and pulled this clip 
But I think it's really important to recognize why I'm a fan of term limits to some extent. And also why I think it's important that we even hold our conservative friends, when I say conservative, somebody who votes more conservative most of the time, accountable when they really go off the rails in some very fundamentally bad ways. So last session, not this session 23, but in 21, when the uh, first ever vote on banning Democrat chairs was had, Briscoe made a speech against it. And I'm not going to play the whole three minutes. I actually have it posted on my YouTube channel. So if you go to my YouTube channel, you can watch the full three minute speech. But let's go to this clip real quick. There are 83 Republicans in this chamber, some of whom vote more like members of the other party, in my opinion. For Pete's sakes, just yesterday, 10 Republicans joined Democrats and voted to impeach President Donald Trump. To be honest, there's a lot of my Democrat colleagues here that I'd much rather have chairing certain committees than some of my Republican colleagues. Just a few of you guys. I want you to think about something. Briscoe Cain, when he got up, basically says, hey guys, it's not Democrats that are the problem, which is, it's just strange to be like, Democrats aren't the problem. They can chair committees. It's the liberal Republicans. You're like, maybe the liberal Republicans are a problem because they work with the Democrats. So just to let you know, if you're a liberal Republican, you're liberal because you're working with the Democrats. And then you go, well, they're the problem, so let's give Democrats chairmanships. What? It's strange. But that's the kind of logic you do when you're trying to perform for leadership. And remember, Briscoe Kane was made a chairman after this speech. Okay? So this is kind of important. You perform to get access. But then he says, if you want to know an example of these kind of traitorous liberal Republicans... 10 Republicans just voted to impeach President Donald Trump. So his example he gives, if you really want to know the problems in the party, these dang people that would dare impeach our president. Now, two years later, he's told, hey, in 72 hours, you're going to vote to impeach and unelect the Attorney General of Texas. Donald Trump says this is a sham. Ted Cruz says this is outrageous and constitutionally abhorrent. I don't know if he said that directly. I just remember there was something about the Constitution, some other stuff. The Republican Party of Texas says, don't do this, all these things. And what does Briscoe Cain do? He votes to impeach him, and then he's an impeachment manager in the Senate. This guy two years ago was saying, vote to keep Democrat chairs because the liberal Republicans are the problem. That's a weird statement. But also then he says, if you want to know what kind of liberal Republicans are out there, some of them are even voting to impeach our own Republican president. And then two years later, he's like, I'm going to vote to impeach our own Republican attorney general. And then he goes on to say, I think there's some Democrats here who'd be better chairman than Republicans, which again is just an absurd statement. Absurd statement. And that's not an endorsement of all these bad Republicans. It's just to say, you, you are so desperate to defend Democrat chairs that you're going to then, but you have to stay conservative. So your only way of doing it is to attack liberal Republicans, who I'm with you in attacking. But I'm attacking them because they're with Democrats. You're attacking them in defense of Democrats. That is strange and sad and shows a fundamental shift. When I posted this, there were a couple party activists who said, well, well, Briscoe votes really conservative. So Luke, Luke shouldn't be criticizing him because of one thing he disagrees with them on. One thing? What one thing? Uh, the Ken Paxton impeachment. Oh, okay. So you think it's just one thing. Again, I will work with Briscoe Kane any day I agree with him. And I think you should largely take that approach with most Republicans. One of the things that we need to do well is disagree on policy, not personality. Okay? Never go after somebody because they, just because of who they are. You should always disagree, contend, criticize, fight, battle with individuals on policy. We disagree. 
My disagreement with Briscoe is I don't think Republicans should be working to defend Democrats and their power in the Texas House. I think that's a very big fundamental disagreement that plays out on multiple battlefields. I also don't think we should impeach Republicans. It's actually not even just impeach Republicans. I don't think that Briscoe Cain should be used as a tool of leadership to go after conservative enemies of a liberal House speaker. I don't think we should be sitting there trying to get Dade Phelan more power. I think he's the main problem. These are fundamental disagreements we have. It's probably why Briscoe has a primary opponent. Because a lot of Republicans, I talked about this last week, a lot of Republicans who aren't even like hardcore conservative fighters and do at times align themselves with Dade Phelan more often than not, voted against impeachment. Some pretty liberal Republicans voted against impeachment. Ones that vote with Democrats a lot. They looked at this and said, yeah, I'm not, I don't need to fall on this sword. So there is a fundamental disagreement. And I think it's important to recognize that when you fall that far, you need a course correction. Representative J.M. Lozano, Representative Gary Gates, good examples of just members who have supported conservative policy in the past, have sometimes voted more with leadership. This Paxton thing happened. They both voted to impeach Paxton. And then they both came out and said, shouldn't have done that. Gary Gates went and met with Ken Paxton, we now know, at a Houston event, gave him a donation, probably to help cover some of his legal bills from the sham impeachment. J.M. Lozano signed on to Tony Tinderholt's resolution. Tony Tinderholt filed a resolution just apologizing to Ken Paxton for the sham impeachment. J.M. Lozano signed on. He's a chairman of Dade Phelan. These are the type of things we're seeing from some members that just go, yeah, I don't, this was a bad idea. And other Republicans seem insistent on doubling down. It's a, it's a poor decision that will have consequences. There's a lot of other stuff going on. I know Christmas is right around the corner, so I don't want to keep you long today. I do look forward to coming to you next week as well. Um, we will be uh, coming to you with one final episode. And next week, I'm going to talk to you about some of the year-end donations that I'm giving. Um, and I, uh, I won't talk about some of the year and campaign donations I'm making because Texas core card is a C3. And, uh, so that's, that's something you have to follow me on a personal level if you want to know, but, um, but I will talk to you about, uh, the year and donations I'm making to various political, um, organizations that I think are doing really good work. So, uh, look forward to that episode with you next week. May you have a blessed week out next time I see y'all or, or come to you and, and you're listening to me. You'll have passed this Christmas time. So take the time to be with your family. Take the time to be with your kids. Uh, slow down, focus. And just remember, you know, our, our church has a Christmas Day service. If you um, if your church doesn't have a Christmas Day service, I, I do think you should consider going to one. Um, really, the church has historically gone to church on Christmas until like 30 years ago. Okay, this isn't even one of those. A lot of church history stopped like 100 or 200 years ago. We changed up a lot of things. This is one that like 50, 60 years ago, people would think it was strange if you didn't go to church on Christmas Day. Uh, this is not me condemning you if you do not. This is me encouraging you to consider uh, finding a Christmas Day service. It is a really good way to, especially if you have young kids, to kind of help instill in them and institute a practice that will help them recognize that the only reason we are celebrating is the birth of a Savior promised by our Creator. May God bless you, and may God bless the great state of Texas.